Greetings, I'm Keith Klein, the host of the VentureViz podcast, where I interview the most fascinating people in the tech scene. This is episode 323, and today's guest is Elizabeth Lawler, founder and CEO of AppMap. A question that I ask every guest at the end of every interview is, what do you like to do for fun outside of work? Oftentimes, I get common answers like hiking, traveling, etc., etc. But Elizabeth's answer, by far, has been the best one yet, and it is proof that she is not only a great entrepreneur, but also a maker at heart. Elizabeth is building with her husband and co-founder Kevin and their kids a two-seater RV-12 airplane. Yes, you heard me right, they are building an airplane together. They previously built a car together when the kids were just six and eight years old, so this is their next challenge, which is phenomenal and so, so cool. AppMap is a leading developer of code visualization and runtime code review analysis technology. Its platform is redefining how developers improve their software and has become one of the fastest growing tools for software visualization and runtime analysis. The company has raised $10 million in funding. In this episode of our podcast, we cover lots of great topics, like a deep conversation around community building and the importance of authenticity, Elizabeth's background story, and how she learned entrepreneurship from her parents, getting her career started in public health research and epidemiology after receiving her PhD, the background story of Conjure, which was bootstrapped initially and raised a minimal amount of capital and had a successful exit to CyberArk, preferred versus common stock, and how that affects the payout post-acquisition, all the details about AppMap and how they built traction and got developers to engage with their product, how Elizabeth is supporting women entrepreneurs and the role that Andy Palmer is playing as well, and so much more. Okay, quick side note, is your company hiring? If the answer is yes, then you might want to add a VentureFizz subscription. It is our employment branding and hiring solution that helps to keep your company top of mind for our targeted audience of professionals in the tech industry. A VentureFizz subscription includes an employment branding page, unlimited postings to our job board, access to our exclusive content series, and so much more. Send an email to info at VentureFizz.com for more details. All right, without further ado, here is my interview with Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Keith. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. Uh, You're a serial entrepreneur. You've built great companies, and I'm excited to learn more of what you're up to now with your current uh, company, AppMap. But before we get into your background story, um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed with a lot of the most successful companies that are building developer tools is their ability to build a community around those products, which I think is hard. I mean, to build community is a very challenging thing for most companies to actually pull that off. Some companies do it very well and are successful, where other companies it's a challenge. It's not just as simple as just saying, hey, we're building a community and it magically happens. So what advice would you have on building that developer community for you know user adoption and just that general sense of community amongst developers? That's a great question. You know, I, I love building developer products because developers are ultimately creative inventors and they have, and they're naturally inquisitive people. And so you know, one of the things that um, we find about going out and trying to build developer tools, both at Conjure and at my current company, AppMap, is that it what you can, what you have the opportunity to do is to create an ongoing conversation with a group of really smart, intelligent people. And so, what we, you know, one of the things that um, developers love to do is try new things, try new technologies, try new um, um, tools. And so, you know. We've really gone out as an open source product and with a you know strong sort of freemium adoption model to try and start that conversation. And we released our first product in 2021 and we've been having, you know, really wonderful engagement with our community ever since. And that's really driven our own thinking, our own product, and building for these people who are building products for others, including ourselves, right? Everything, everything is software and we're all um, the, the beneficiaries of, of the products of their work, it just creates this really virtuous cycle of bringing people in and um, helps them helping, you know, your product is helping them and then they're helping you think and refine your own, your own ideas about what to build. And that's so important. Like you're getting that user feedback immediately that helps you build better products that helps solve their problems that they're struggling with. 
Yeah, yeah. And we do that. We've done, you know, we've used a lot of different methods um, to try and build community. One of the things that we are we often do is we write a lot on developer forums, but not about our product necessarily. We write about things that are common issues that developers face. And it's, you know, it just resonates with people that you're talking about their experience and their, you know, the challenges that they're facing, even if it has nothing to do with particularly what your, you know, what your product does or what you might be um, selling. And, uh, you know, because I think developers really, they don't lend themselves to being sold to, you know, really what they will do is if they find value in, in what you do and they find what you have to say important to their own work or important to their, you know, their own evolution of their art and their craft, then they'll, they'll participate, you know? It's got to be authentic because if it is forced or lead gen, they'll sniff that out and totally push you aside and never return. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Which is why we have such a so such widespread adoption for our you know our user population. We've grown, you know, from the first dozen users to um, now over um, closing in on hundred thousand developers who use that map for their daily work. So. Wow, that is awesome. Cool. All right. Well, let's rewind the clock. So let's talk about your background story. Where did you grow up? What were you like as a child? Oh, my goodness. Um, so uh, I, I grew up in Northern Virginia. Um, I came to Boston as a student. I, I got a scholarship to go to Boston University. Um, and I kind of stayed here ever since. Um, but as a kid, I was probably naturally inquisitive. I think I always thought I would grow up to be a scientist, um, uh, you know, kind of a bookworm. Um, I wasn't my dad was an entrepreneur. Um, he owned his, he built and owned his own businesses and I got to participate in those. Um, he actually had a business that made customized cookie tins, um, you know, like the kind you get at Christmas, uh, or, you know, at a, uh, for a holidays. And I would work with him. So an actual manufacturing shop. plant, like a manufacturing Yeah, a manu like a, so cool. he was a very small shop, but he would yeah. do things for, you know, um, Saks Fifth Avenue and, and people who had like special tin work that they needed to have done around the holidays. And, um, you know, I got to see firsthand the kind of grit and determination and long hours that it takes to build a business. And, you know, his was a small scale business, but we, it was a family business. We all worked in it. And, um, and, uh, many of my high school friends worked there too, <laughs> um, you know, and, um, you know, whether it was packaging boxes or running silk screening presses, um, you know, I think I just always sort of under, you know, kind of was exposed to that and uh, never really thought I would become an entrepreneur, to be honest. I thought I was going to be a scientist or a doctor or astrophysicist or something like that. But um, I fell in love with programming and then ultimately started seeing opportunities as a result of that. And I guess those two streams of my history kind of collided. <laughs> well, that's why I love doing this podcast, just to talk about people's backgrounds. So, you know, I grew up in Manchester, New Hampshire. My dad had a leather coat manufacturing like company. Like they sewed and cut leather and made coats and shipped them uh, all over the United States. But it was a small family business. And same thing where I learned at a very early age about work and grit and what goes into that. And I think it's a great foundation. And when you see someone like yourself, who's been a multi-time successful entrepreneur, that foundational story is something that was very meaningful to your journey. Yes. And now we, you know, and, and as a parent, now I get to pass some of that on to my kids. So just like my father and my mother worked together, I actually work with my husband. And, and that has been the case in both of my um, most recent startups, not the first startup I was in, but the second and now the third. And um, my kids get to see how, what hard work and determination and, you know, resilience looks like. And, and I, I see it manifesting in their own sort of little journeys, you know, whether I have one little entrepreneur who's age 10 and, he, you know, he's trying to sell all kinds of things at this, at school, they've got like a baking, uh, you know, a baking, a little, uh, business where they're selling brownies to each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It's, you know, we've got all sorts of things going on. All right. So how did you get your career started coming out of uh, Boston university? So I, um, graduated, um, first with a degree in science and I got my master's um, at Boston University and then I got my doctorate there. Um, 
I went initially went into public health, but um, during my master's, I fell in love with programming um, and IT. And so I became a reluctant IT administrator and a data scientist. And I loved um, working in data and big data before it was called data science. I think it was just called statistics. And, um, and that is, I started my career actually in the government, but I was in a really entrepreneurial group. And we were building up different kinds of IT systems to do big data analytics and um, building all kinds of figuring out how to leverage um, data that were going unused um, for public health research and for um, scientific inquiry. And I think that was kind of really where I started to see opportunities around cloud, DevOps, um, you know, of the opportunity to use big data more effectively in business. And I think that's where I ended up ultimately leaving and then going off to startups after that. Did you get any pushback? Like, cause you did go, you know, got your PhD, right? And yeah. you kind of ended up doing something a little bit different than maybe what you set out to do. So did you get pushback of people being like, what are you, you're, you're doing what, why would you do that? Yeah. Like everybody's like, wow, you went to school for 10 years and you just check your degree. Well, I not right, like really. all the research projects that you were, <laughs> right. all the research yeah, projects you were exactly. involved in. I'm just thinking like, that's a commitment to get to that, that level. You know, I, I thought about that a lot. And, you know, I think that at this, at some level, what it really, what I learned throughout my doctorate um, and my master's program was how to think and solve problems using information and data. And um that is a lifelong skill. Like what, you know, when you think about what kind of information is available to you, how you can leverage that information to provide insights or to get, to get more, you know, more meaningful um, interpretation of what kind of decision to make, like it, whether you're using it from, for medicine or you're using it for business, it's the same kind of skill set. looking for patterns in the data and then being able to sort of like hypothesis test and iterate and prove or disprove things. These are all the same language we use in startups. Do you know what I mean? Like I've got a hypothesis, business hypothesis. I'm going to go out and test it. I'm going to run an experiment. I'm going to A-B test this thing. It's all the same skills. And so I found them imminent, like totally transferable. It was really interesting um, from one from one sphere to another. And what I had, you know, really the benefit of is, is all of the, you know, um, kind of scientific river that I got to bring you know, to some of that, I think sometimes maybe in business, we don't actually have as much scientific rigor as we, we do when we're trying to prove something out of medicine. But, um, but yeah, I got to take all those, school, those skills with me. And, um, and, you know, I think in many ways, early stage startups is a lot like science. You know, it's a lot like frontier. You're looking at the edge of the frontier of a market. It's just a different sphere. But you're saying, okay, well, here's, here's a boundary. Can I go bust through one of those boundaries and find some new insight, new information, a new place to make some inference and make, you know, build a business. And I like working in kind of white spaces like that. So it's, um, you know, I think perhaps it's a lot like science in, in my particular case, trying to build up white space markets. Um, like Conjure was a first to market solution. AppMap is a first to market solution. You know, it's a lot. I think we're kind of working in the same domain, but like us under a slightly different title. Well, and your world was epidemiology. So, I yeah. mean, so this is information. And nobody that, knew what that was until right, 2020. Until 2020. <laughs> when I was... Right. I see. I really pick growth careers, Keith. I like, I went to like high growth industry, but I'm always early to market. So I was too early to market in epidemiology because the pandemic well, didn't I wanted come to know, like, 10 years. So you were with the Massachusetts <laughs> Epi, Epi, I can't even pronounce it, the Massachusetts epidemiology research and information center like what were they working on because like you said it's like you're always you don't think a pandemic's actually going to happen until it actually happens <laughs> like but i'm sure they yeah. were thinking like if this does happen or whatever you know like this is a lot yeah. of data so so that place was it was really like an entrepreneurship before that was a cool or that was even titled it was like a okay. very entrepreneurial research group we did everything we did clinical trials research. We did observational research leveraging data. We did post-marketing drug surveillance to try and find out if there were like, um, you know, adverse drug events happening after drugs were released into the population. Cause you know, they do like clinical trials and then they, they do it on a few thousand people and then they actually release it and you find out you get these random other side effects um, from drugs. Um, and so I worked on all of those types of research projects. I built up big data 
infrastructure to be able to answer all kinds of questions. And then the last project I worked on um, was called the Million Veteran Program, where we were trying to re recruit a million veterans to donate um, information about their health and genomic samples so that we could do more in-depth research. And so all of these were like boundary breaking initiatives. We had to build up a bioinformatics program. We had to build up big data analytics, uh, IT structures that were you know, calling over distributed data information systems from all over the VA so we could do research. Like a lot of this was like infrastructure, IT data. How do you use it? How can we leverage um, information um, more effectively? And so then, um, and you know, I had become the deputy director of that center and then ultimately thought, well, you know, to really take this to the next level, I'd really like to go to the to the private sector and see what more there is to be done out there. Because there was at the time there was, you know, obviously a lot more information from health information um, systems out in the wild. And it was before we had any centralization of of um, insurance data and stuff like that. So I wanted to go out and work on projects out in the private sector. And so I joined a company called Generation Health and that was founded by the people who had started Medco, which was an incredibly successful um, male pharmacy um, uh, company. And uh, and I, for there, I got kind of firsthand look at how do you build businesses, right? So I'd done the technical parts of building up novel technologies inside of the government, but I'd never done the business component. So there I got to work with Rich Jacksberg and Pearl Lofberg and others to try and um, and learn how they thought about building business, which was like being on the front, like that's the front row of working with real pros who knew their industry really well. And that was a company that was ultimately acquired by CBS Caremark. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So that was your first exposure in the private sector of building Correct. something and leading to an yeah. exit. Um, which, you know, when you look at your career, it's like academia that was preparing you for, you know, what you ended up doing now, the, you know, experience in the public sector and then private sector. Yeah. So it just, there's this story, this arc that totally tells the tale of kind of what led you down this path of, you know, being this entrepreneur. So, um, you know, the common themes that run through that is that, you know, maybe at the time it wasn't as big of a deal, but. But when I started my first company, Conjure, the importance of regulatory compliance, you know, having started in the government gave you a view on things like cybersecurity, regulatory compliance, you know, certain types of practices that at the time would have felt like it was, you know, a, a detour, but ultimately came to meet back up with the market later, right? So all of that experience ended up ultimately feeding into Conjure when we started working there uh, on that project. Obviously, we just talked about how this all kind of brought you lots of you know great experience and information to lead you down the path to creating your own company. So how did that come to fruition? Yeah. So, you know, I think some of the best ideas come from solving problems that you know about yourself. Um, and so, and I think in the case of Conjure, that was a problem that I definitely knew um, and had been experiencing at my previous company, Generation Health, which were challenges and barriers to the adoption of cloud and DevOps, which were the two most transformational initiatives going on in software development in IT at the time. And, and this is 2011 um, you know, for context for the audience. This is 2011. Yeah, right? so it's early, right? Like, um, you know, there aren't a lot of people who are putting like regulated workloads into public cloud at the time. Certainly DevOps was new, um, but what I, so, so I, this was like a classic kitchen table moment. I'm sitting there at my kitchen table with my husband and he's working in a startup, which is a small startup in the biotech industry, but he's doing DevOps. He's got a very small IT team and development team. He's using Amazon cloud. He was an early user of Chef. He had all of this automation and scalable infrastructure and all the things that I wish that I had and didn't have. And I'm sitting over in this other in this other IT system where it's like, I have to ask a guy to get me a server. I have to beg people to move data from point A to point B. <laughs> like I'm sitting there struggling and I'm like, I just want all the things that you have, but compliance and security are keeping me from having them. I can't, I can't get people past this notion. And so we would just like debate over like the root cause of the issue. And ultimately we came up with the observation that the real difference between classical IT and what was coming was that you were offloading a lot of the responsibility to code. 
So whether you were making infrastructure as code or code was deploying your application in the case of Chef or configuring your infrastructure, um, code was the new privileged user. And so as soon as we saw that moment, that aha moment, we couldn't unsee it, right? Like we were like, this is the problem. There's no construct for code running things, doing things for you. And so we wanted to create a solution to that problem because we saw that ultimately as going to be the gaming issue for people ultimately moving and meeting their compliance requirements um, to try to go to public cloud or um, private cloud, hybrid cloud, or using DevOps. And so we were early to market. Um, there, Amazon at the time did not have an IAM system, for example. Um, there were no secrets management solutions for cloud, which now we think about as being like table stakes, right? Like, you know, and you know, your GitHub account will review your code and look for plain text secrets and source control. But at the time, LinkedIn, Facebook, all the major companies were getting breached for precisely those reasons that they had credentials laying around in their code bases and hackers were finding them and like getting into their clouds. And so, um, so we said, well, look, this is a huge business opportunity because the most advanced cloud users are having security problems owing to this, owing to these issues. It's something that's gonna block every regulated industry from adopting cloud. So let's go solve that problem. And we have to go build something entirely new to do it because there wasn't anything that could work at cloud scale. Um, and would provide secrets management, machine identity, and authentication and authorization for non-human actors. And so this was like science, right? It, it was very much a boundary. It was something we were going to need to invent into. And um, and we were the we were the first product to market in that space. Well, so you were building a, a new category. Uh, so how did you even get yeah. started as far as building the product, the platform? Like, um, did you raise funding initially? Like, how did you get started? We got started initially by bootstrapping. So, um, so this is one of those great stories, um, which is that you know I was working at the time several different jobs. I was uh, teaching at night, <laughs> I was consulting, and I had a day job um, working as a chief data officer. So I we were I was basically hustling so Kevin could quit his job and um, start building up. Um, the platform. So we initially started by working with um, biotech companies that were looking to, they had big data problems when we're looking to offload um, workload to cloud. And so we um, we started by working with those groups and uh, the Broad Institute here in Boston and Novartis and others. And um, we were building up basically the platform with them. And then um, as soon as we started, we kind of built a V1 of it. And as soon as we knew what the real characteristics were, um, we got out of an experimentation and started to productize. And at that time, we raised venture capital. And then we went out and we sold our first deal to Netflix. And um, they were a huge cloud user at the time. And uh, that was a real sentinel moment for, for our company. Um, and then from there, we had a pretty fast run. We only ran that company for about three and a half years, almost four. Um, but we had made it major media companies, large banks, and um, who are using our platform, all of whom were trying to adopt cloud and DevOps and move workload um, to more automation. And we were out uh, at Velocity Conference and other places being some of the first people talking about security, DevSecOps, it wasn't even called DevSecOps at the time, but security and compliance as a DevOps principle and um, and started to build the market up then. And then we got a... Um, then we got an offer from CyberArk. Yeah, and and you didn't raise a, a, a lot of, I mean, compared to what no, we've seen. A little the, bit. <laughs> yeah, like it was enough. But I think what why I love doing this podcast is obviously we talk about your background story, but we talk about building companies and there's different ways to build a company. And you bootstrapped, you hustled, you and your husband found a way to start building it while you know allowing him to go do it full-time while you continue to work. And then going all in on it, raising a little bit of capital and having an exit mm -hmm. by CyberArk, which um, I would imagine was an amazing moment because, uh, you know, you look at these, the media, and I'm just going to vent about the media. They always talk about the unicorns, right? And these, you know, you got to have these exits of these valuations. You got to raise all this capital. Yet bootstrap, mm -hmm. small amount raise, great exit. Everyone wins, right? <laughs> Exactly. And I still, if, despite the froth in the market during the last period of time where AppMath was um, raising capital, I believe that still. So what you want to make sure as an entrepreneur 
and as someone who takes venture capital because it is important is that everyone's on the right side of the money, right? Like that you have exit opportunities that match the stage of your business and that for which you, you know, you've got the opportunity to return capital plus make money to all of the parties who are involved. And so, you know, I think that's really important. And, and that's not something, it, to your point, it has been um, fetishized perhaps, the, the notion that raising money in it itself has, you know, is the goal or is perhaps the, you know, the mark or the hallmark of, of, uh, of a, um, a great opportunity. But that's, you know, we looked at the unfortunate, um, ep, you know, uh, eulogies of basically a lot of different startups over the last year, some of which have raised hundreds of millions of dollars, some of which have raised, you know, not as much money, but have not succeeded and not returned capital. And so, and not made people money. And so, you know, your job is to make sure you make money first and foremost, and you're in the commons, right? So that means it's after you pay out the preferred you're going to make money. So as long as you're constantly keeping that math at the forefront of your mind, you will raise the right amount of capital at the right times. <laughs> and you're bringing up points that people don't talk about the payout after the deal happens, the preferred, the common, like, like all these things. It's just like, people don't talk about these. And, um, and then you hear horror stories of, you know, raise capital, exit opportunity board says no because it's not the multiple that they need for their fund and their lps but it's yeah. life-changing for the entrepreneur that has put 10 years of their blood sweat and tears into something or so you know like so it's just like yeah and that's and i think that's really about picking your team so you know there's a lot of pe there's more capital there out there than there are great ideas or great people to execute against them so you know when you think about building up a set of investors, when you think about building up a set of people who are going to be along with you on the journey, it's so important to understand not only your philosophy for what you think are, and it may change, right? You may say, oh, well, I'd be really happy with a $42 million exit. And your initial investors may also be happy with a $42 million exit. You know, you're going to have, you know, three, four, five X on multiple on, on, you know, on the capital that you're returning. And that's fine for them. It's right in the middle of their distribution curve, but other investors will not be happy with that. And you need to pick and choose who you want on your team based on what you're, what, you know, what outcomes you're interested in seeing. And then the same thing's true with like, you know, as again, like how much capital should you raise? What, you know, what's the philosophy behind building the business? What are some of the motions you're going to have to take? And what risk tolerance do they have for them, you know, with those motions with, you know, or did you have the right people around the table? So, you know, if, for example, one of the things that I've worked really hard to do in the AMAP case is to make sure I had people around the table who understood the markets, which I'm both adjacent to and working in. So, you know, I brought people who have written, you know, who write the, the the leading developer led growth market analysis per year you know every year his his blog post Tyler Jules blog post on developer led growth is some is a must read from people who are who are working in the space i've seen it cited by by investors and funds in which i'm an lp like you know he just knows this inside and out and i'm like so i sought him out and i was like i really want to work with you I've got people who on the app map, uh, in the app map investor pool who built observability businesses, which are adjacent to the market that I'm working in. And they really understand that market. So you get people around the table who know not only your market, but also have a line philosophy around what good exit points or, or good hallmarks of, of, of uh, positive outcomes are. And you get all those people together and then you raise the right amount of capital. And honestly doing it more slowly than people often do. They go out and build one big round, you know, you end up underwater. I mean, you could go out. I knew people who were raising 20, $25 million rounds with no product. Now they <laughs> had to go raise something at a hundred plus, you know, like uh -huh. that's it, the, 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 the gulf funny. between here and there is humongous. So, yep. you know, you and I've been trying to get together on this podcast for quite a while. And I, you know, partly was one of the things I wanted to, you know, anchor on was a funding announcement, which we finally recently did, but it, the, my approach has been slow and steady, you know, like a little bit of funding over various milestones of growth has really gotten me to where I am and to where the company is. And we've done it thoughtfully without taking on too much dilution and making sure the investors and the common are on the right side of the money. And that I think is just, 
it, it was prudent before, but it wasn't fashionable, but it's more prudent now. Right. It came full circle again. So <laughs> yeah. but it just sound business principles. It just makes sense versus the frothiness of what was happening. It just was not sustainable and everyone's paying the price for that. But if yeah. you build a business and look that at has AI a now, right? Mm -hmm. Like the AI market has gotten very frothy and it's going to be yeah. difficult for people to maintain, you know, um, market positions in some of those in, with some of those um, companies. And and now, you know, open AI demo days are the new Amazon <laughs> things where you're like, oh, there's companies dying, you know? Like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Right, so once the acquisition happened, like what was after like did they keep you as like a standalone business for a while like like what was the transition the integration like after the acquisition yeah actually we ended up building uh we ended up being um absorbed fully into cyberarc um they okay. were under cyberarc that was a great acquisition it was a really amazing team to learn from learning from udi and others about how they built such a successful and enduring business in the privileged account security space they were the market leader in the space we were disrupting. So it made sense, tremendous amounts of sense that we were acquired by them. Um, uh, they were undergoing their own DevOps transformation, you know? And so they were going from three tier .NET architecture of their application to understanding Kubernetes and cloud native and containerization. And we brought that um, into their organization. So not only did we represent technical change, but we also represented um, <clears throat> some of the sort of more dev-led growth, um, go-to-market business changes. And I think ultimately that's, um, you know, we were both, um, they were on a path to, to evolving some of their business and we were, um, we came in to help, help do that. So I was the VP of dev DevSecOps for, um, for the period of time after the acquisition. And then, you know, um, I was on a 90% travel schedule, so it got a little tiring <laughs> over the period of time that I was working there, so, but I got to go all around the world um, and meet people um, with CyberArk and, and talk about DevSecOps and, and the role of CyberArk's um, products and services. But ultimately, I, I got founderitis, and so did Kevin, <laughs> who was also part of the acquisition. And so we ended up leaving and taking some time off, and then ultimately we founded Atma. But I think about that at that sale and, you know, um, I think it was a tremendous success for Conjure. Um, it was definitely the right home. Our go to market was more aligned with what their go to market was. But I learned a lot more about what I would have done differently in the year, I think, after that. So um, I we competed directly with HashiCorp Vault and um, HashiCorp Vault ultimately became a, one of the leading product lines in terms of revenue for HashiCorp and part and a major component of their IPO. And I think although AppMap is a success story and was a success story for Boston that year in terms of acquisitions, um, I think Conjure. I learned a lot more. I mean, yes, I'm sorry, Conjure was a, was a success story for, for Boston um, startups that year. I learned a lot about what I would have done differently to um, from that from that experience. Because I watched the um, growth at which HashiCorp Vault was being adopted, not necessarily monetized, but the adoption of HashiCorp Vault. And that taught me a tremendous amount about dev-led dev growth at the time. So I was selling into sort of cybersecurity and going through a sort of more typical cybersecurity sales process with Conjure. And it was DevOps adjacent. So I had DevOps champions and I had cybersecurity champions, but cybersecurity was really making the the budgeting decision, whereas HashiCorp was going dev first, DevOps first, and that they had distribution and we had to sell. And from that point on, I think that was a really, it was a really important learning. And, and I'll say how brave Udi and the team were and that we knew that going into the acquisition and within four months, they open sourced Conjure, which was, they had no open source projects. They only had closed source projects, but they, started, they started working with us to get more distribution. And I think that was incredibly brave of them. That was, um, it was a tremendous amount of trust between them and, um, and our team. And I think that ultimately um, was the right, right choice that they got. Um, they started to get, we started to really start to grow adoption by meeting developers where they were by open sourcing.
Yeah, I mean, like hindsight, obviously, is 2020 and Monday morning quarterback, like product led growth wasn't like a thing as it is now, right? Like the sales models, how yeah. they evolved and community led and developer led or PLG, like those things weren't commonplace. So selling the way you were was what you did. <laughs> But it was, it was what you did. And so now, you know, but going into AdMap, I think we learned a lot about that and we made a lot of changes as a result. So going developer, developer led growth, PLG, open source, you know, really start to build, you know, the evidence for, for viral adoption and adoption across organizations for the product. You know, I think that, uh, you know, across an organization for the product, I think that was some of the stuff that we learned about, you know, really from that experience that we took forward with us, which was which was invaluable. All right. So how did, how did the idea come to fruition for app map? Well, you know, again, scratching it up <laughs> um, when we started, you know, when we, when we were acquired by um, CyberArk, we had to explain our product to an whole nother software development team. And we were a Ruby Kubernetes native application. Um, and they were .NET engineers doing, doing three tier architecture and not <laughs> So, you know, we spent probably 18 months trying to get to technical alignment so we could deliver um, features and functionality with velocity and having, you know, kind of common understanding of what uh, good integrations would, how they would work and things like that. And it involved tremendous amounts of whiteboarding and documentation, and requirements specking. And, and I kind of like looked at Kevin one day and I said, you know, what if the software could just answer all these questions for everybody? <laughs> what if the software could just tell you <laughs> what do we have to do it because we're faulty interpreters right like software is what it is it's declarative it's a it's a system that operates under certain principles it has certain behavior patterns it has certain characteristics and it is what it is but humans have to go around explaining to one another how it works which is immediately not correct because we're going to make shortcuts or interpret something or kind of guessing how it works or maybe we're not very clear and our communication. And so we kind of developed this notion. We said, you know, what if you could create a common set of artifacts? What if you could, um, what if software is its own best interpreter, its own best explainer? Like what would that world look like and how much would that improve developers understanding productivity, the quality of their work, the security of their application, the performance of an application? if the software constantly gave you feedback about the code you were working on. And um, so we're like, let's go explore that. And um, so, yeah, that was how we started AdMap. We first started with the principle that, you know, if, if the principle of um, Conjure was that code was the new privileged user, that was the reason we started that company, it was like the founding idea. The principle of AdMap was that design was the new constraint in software development. But people, it isn't that people don't write code quickly, even more quickly now that we have co-pilots and everything like that. It's that we don't, we don't have made the right design choices. And those become very expensive defects that, that according to Stripe and other research, developers waste about 40% of their, um, their work week on remediating. Wow. It's a tremendous amount of wasted effort. And and it's because we're confused. <laughs> we're not exactly crystal clear on the right solution to the problem. So without information or data to help inform people's decision-making early in the process at the time of code inception or creation, then you end up with very expensive defects you have to fix. And you end up with refactoring or uh, security flaws or performance issues that you spend a lot of money on observability tools to try and characterize and then remediate using root cause analysis and stuff, you know, site reliability engineers. It's just a very inefficient system. So we said, okay, well, let's go make something new. And we're going to go build basically what's the equivalent of, I think some of our users call it a robotic software architect that is the software describing itself. Back to the developers. You can ask it questions um, about performance, security, uh, reliability. You can ask it questions uh, to describe how it works and show the flow of information through the software. And it reflects it all back to developers where they work, which is their code editor. Well, as you stated before, when we were talking about Conjure, like you build companies, you know, not at a super rapid pace, you're building at a steady base for a foundation, which is smart. Uh, Cause you started this company in uh, like summer of 2019, from what I can tell. 
Yeah, I think we started incubating in the 20, summer of 2019. We took our first seed funding in 2020. This We knew this was going to be a deep research project because it was we had to create data that didn't otherwise exist. Um, we had to create novel ways of recording information about software. Um, and there was nothing off the shelf that we could use. So yeah, we've been building slow and steady ever since. We started with one language, Ruby, in one code editor, VS Code, and have been building out ever since. Yeah, because again, how did you get adoption from developers? Because I'm sure when you approach companies or developers, yes, this is a problem. And it's something that we would love a solution. Yet, if it doesn't exist yet, how do you start to get people to trust that this is going to be what they need? Yeah. So one of the things I think that was an insight about that is that you need something, you need like a... Um, you need a way for people to understand or um, connect with what you're trying to do really quickly. And that first insight about that was the map. So we, you know, we we give away basically the ability to map your application. So it's um, to be able to make pictures that describe back to developers how their software works when it runs, which is not like something you can glean from reading the code, right? The actual behavior of it through behavior pathways. That app map feature we gave away for free. And we, because that was the data foundation and we needed help from the developer community to help us solidify that data foundation. And so we said, well, let's make, let's put a beautiful graphical interface over top of the data foundation. And that created resonance with our users. And so, um, so by giving away the ability to have instantaneous pictures of how your software or this change in software you've just written will behave when it runs was something that was a key tool. Developers didn't have it and it, it was visceral, right? People wanted it. <laughs> and so, um, so with that, that was how we first started getting developers to engage with our product. And the other thing was, I think. You know, like I mentioned, going back to the very beginning, having worked in government and then in cybersecurity and now in developer tools, we also had another key insight, which was that, you know, code is a sensitive data asset. It's just as sensitive as, to, you know, to a business as, you know, your personal data is to you. And um, so we made sure that we built AppMap so that we didn't take any data. So now, not only did we have to build something brand new, we also had to, couldn't host it. And so we had to, uh, we really needed the help of our developer population in order for us to build that out successfully. And, but I think people understood that there's an elegance to that design and there's a, a sensitivity to their own needs that we created it in this way, um, that people have been very helpful and engaged um, in providing us feedback and, and helping us improve the product over the last few years. We talk about how um, CyberArk open source Conjure so mm -hmm. what have you learned, you know, you know, app map, like the pros and cons of running a, a an open source product? Yeah, I mean, I think in this case, you know, we have, I mean, the open source um, aspects of it have allowed us to, I think, penetrate industries, but, but both not posting data and being open source have allowed us to penetrate industries we would not otherwise have access to. So app map is used by everyone from Fortune 50 companies to coding schools. And the reason we can have people in government roles and other places like that adopt us is because we took this approach. We wanted to become a lingua franca. And if you look at really successful developer tools companies like Docker, they became the way you did it, right? They are the tool you think of when you think of containerization. You know, there are, they're almost like a utility, like a public utility. Like it has so much value to so many people. It isn't, you know, it's not controversial um, that they're open source or that they, you know, um, uh, that they have to have had to build a community. I think we thought about AppMap that way, which is that our data models open source, our link, our agents are open source. Um, you know, our uh, VS Code integration, for example, is open source, and that has allowed us to get adoption and get. Um, uh, uh, feedback on the product and um, use, use some utilization from, from all kinds of industries, which has helped us, um, you know, bridge the requirements gap that otherwise wouldn't, you know, it takes sometimes on the flip side, other companies years to understand or, or to be able to get that information. And how'd you figure out the, the, 
Well, how did you figure out the business model then? So at what point do you charge users and figure out the pricing yeah. on that end? Yeah. So, you know, the fortunate thing is that for, for certain, com certain companies and certain industries, they cannot run on supported software. So, you know, an, the open source business model tends to lend itself to that. So some of the early, um, early wins come from that. But what we've since learned is that there's a whole ecosystem of integration for which, you know, there are, we'll say lower, um, you know, more small company uh, adoption opportunities or, or in even individual level paid, um, paid uh, enhancement opportunities for value added services. So we recently launched our CI integration for um, GitHub Actions and that's a user seat license paid um, solution. And it's not sold in an enterprise way. It's sold, you know, just to consumers of any type or stripe that um, need to pay for CI integration for app maps. And so we have a whole bunch of new products that are coming out this year, which all have that characteristic. So we've kind of gone up market and come down um, in order to, you know, with, with, cert with certain other value added features. Now, it was a, a tough climate to raise funding last year, and we're still mm -hmm. in the muck right now. Um, you announced your most recent round of funding, so it was a $10 million round uh, announced in November of last year. It was, Yes, it was a cumulative announcement of, all, of fundraising for AppMap. We've never done a funding announcement. So we, as I mentioned, we sort of raised money in bits and pieces over a period of time. So we did a cumulative fundraising announcement in November of last year. Um, closing out a funding cycle so we could say we were no longer raising money <laughs> and put a hard stop to it. <laughs> so so what what was that like though, you know, raising capital last year for that final close of the round? Yeah, and even the previous year during which there was like a lot of layoffs and developer tools, you know, I think that the growth of adoption, you know, we've really um, been able to grow our install base from the initial few thousand to now um, closing in on hundred thousand has been really a positive sign for the pro for the for the company. And then um, I think also, as I mentioned, the distribution of um, types of organizations that were using AMAP, um, uh, you know, definitely investors saw the opportunity to continue to to participate and help us grow into. Um, you know, grow into the next phase of, of the company. And, and so now I, I think that it was, you know, if you've got strong product market, product fit, you know, you've got product user fit and you're going for product market fit, it, you know, that's a great place in which, to, you know, investors who specialize in that type of um, investment, um, uh, uh, those types of investments will want to lean in. You know, uh, we had very strong evidence of product user fit and we're, starting to look at product market fit. And uh, there's like a certain stage of seed investor who specializes in that. And, you know, that 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 shape of a company resonates with them. And so that was the most recent fundraising round um, that we closed. And then we'll be going for, you know, a growth round um, in the future too. Yeah, I mean, again, it goes back to like kind of the foundation of this conversation. You built a real product with adoption mm -hmm. users. So for an investor to look at that, it's not the hypotheticals of, I think there's something here. And if you invest right. in us, we'll figure out if there is. It's like, no, they're, yeah. they've got a repeat founder. So the I'm sure the conversations, it's not easy to raise capital regardless, but you know, it still helps. It does. And then, you know, in your job as a, as a founder and an entrepreneur, particularly in the early stage, is to provide that evidence, whether it's um, patent applications, which we've gotten patented um, for some of the technology we built. It's uh, the metrics of adoption and utilization. It's the, you know, it's a, a lot of what I think draws people to us is the fact that our community writes about us. You know, we've had blog posts about AppMap that are written by people we don't even know. Um, you know that. That's great. You know, those types of things really lend credibility to the value that you provide. Um, to that developer, uh, in our case, to the developer population. All right, so you presented at TechCrunch, TechCrunch Disrupt and were very successful there. So what was that experience like? Oh, that is like, that experience is singular. Um, it's nothing like anything I've ever done. You, you know, it's a five minute, the last year we did a five minute pitch and then, um, you know, we ended up in the top five. Um, I had, I, I actually applied on a lark. I didn't even, really think that we were going to go the distance there. Um, but, you know, I think that it is, you know, just the preparation, the fact that you have to do it with no notes, you're up there in front of 
you know, thousands of people in the room and then, you know, millions of people streaming online. It, it's really, um, it really is nerve wracking. Uh, kind of a pressure cooker. <laughs> it's very nerve wracking. I'm sure I didn't, you know, I, I don't even, it was kind of a blur. I don't even remember. It. <laughs> but, um, but I was really delighted to go back again this year. They invited us to come back in um, at the most recent tech crunch. I don't think they've ever invited a company back to back years before. And we got to give an update about the business and where we'd, um, how we'd grown it since then. And I was just thrilled to be back on the stage again. And, um, and I must say, it is in terms of uh, creating awareness for our product, it really did launch, it launched the initial version of the code editor extension. And since then it launched, um, help us launch the platform. It, it was really a wonderful experience. I'm truly grateful to have participated. Well, we need more women founders, more you know women entrepreneurs taking that path to building a company. So what can we do to encourage more of that happening and more women getting funded? So this is something that I um, feel very strongly about personally. You know, I worked with, when I started and took the leap to start my own company, I got a chance to work with Andy Palmer. And he is definitely a known quantity here in Boston. He's a legend. He was a great, he's a legend. He's a great CEO, coach, and mentor. And he taught me a lot of what, uh, I know today about, you know, being able to drive results and execution in the, in the business domain. And he is secretly one of the biggest angel investors in women in Boston. He, if you look at his portfolio, he's overweight on women. And because women are a value investment, honestly, you know, we work, we take less capital overall. We tend to have outside result outsized results as a, as a, um, as a amount of capital invested. And so for me, I focus a lot of my mentoring and angel um, check investments on women, particularly women working in technology um, and infrastructure. And um, I think that he's like a first check guy. And um, I think it's really like, even if it's just giving someone $5,000 so that they can go and put together a pitch deck and, you know, fly to a couple of places and pitch some potential customers and, you know, start to to build up the business model and business plan for the the venture that they'd like to launch. Like, I think it's really important that, you know, first check angel investors focus on, focus on women. And, um, and so that's, that's been something that I definitely feel um, very strongly about. Um, the other thing that I think that where we need more women's voices is on, you know, uh, content, is a great way to build a community. And, and you're doing that here at Venture Fizz. And I really think a lot about that, particularly for women in the tech, in you sort of like in the enterprise B2B, you know, developer tools sector, the observability sector. Um, there are women, I think we need more voices. They need to be at speaking engagements, but through content like Venture Fizz and other sorts of technical podcasts, I think we have the opportunity to get more women out there and to get their voices heard and then they create opportunities to build up businesses um, around around what they're doing, and and so yeah, I, I'm. This is something that I'm definitely feel very strongly about, and um, you know, there's not enough opportunities. I think if I think if if anything, I'm, I'm like really wondering what the uh, venture analysis is going to be on the last year, whether women were hit disproportionately hard during the contraction. Uh, I have a suspicion that's probably true. Well, hopefully any investors that listen to this will like, Andy Palmer's got this <laughs> edge over us and we'll follow suit and, and hopefully he does. good things happen. He doesn't advertise it either. It's like, it, he just, he just does it. He just takes action. And so, you know, I felt the same way. And so um, I'm, I'm, you know, particularly interested in mentoring women who are looking to go into dev tools and infrastructure. And, and I work with a number of great women like Bazia from Slice Up and Sharon Goldberg from uh, Bastion Zero and others who I watched flourish in their businesses. And I'm really excited to see what they have to, what, uh, what, will, be holding, what will be coming for them in 2024. So what, what's the size of your team now? And like, like, how are you thinking about like building out the culture of the company? Yeah, so I think, so we're pretty, we're still a pretty lean team. I think one of the things that we've done been is very, um, 
um, very careful and measured in in growing our in growing our team footprint. So you know we're twelve people and we're um, you know we're pro we're growing slowly um, over the next I think next year. But um, as I think about you know how we grow our team and how we, the kinds of folks that we're interested in working with, I think it's very similar to Conjure, which is that everyone who we worked with at Conjure had come from, had a background. This was from everyone from the sales people to the marketing people to everyone um, had come from an engineering background. And for the first, you know, 20 to 30 people that you have inside of your organization, everyone has to have empathy for the end user and for the team that you're working in. It's not a, it's not really a scaling thing. You've, you know, you have to be able to resonate with the problems and the experiences of your customer. And so everyone who we're looking for now has, whether you're in sales or marketing or DevRel or whatever, will have come from, you know, an engineering background and will, um, uh, it will be able to translate that into the, you know, skill or domain that they, that they're working in. Very cool. All right. So yeah, apps... we're all engineers. <laughs> well, that's smart. I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, that's, I mean, my background is recruiting and I think that's why VentureFizz has been successful because it all speaks about, you know, building teams and hiring and culture. And uh, I think there's lots of businesses that are built just because th someone thinks that they have this epiphany idea, but don't have the empathy of actually doing the work to know that that is a real problem. And, you know, like the classic, B school students sitting around a whiteboard thinking about what industries need to be disrupted type of thing with no experience in that particular industry. So anyways. I, I think you absolutely have to have it. And you know, like I said, if you if you can't speak in the language of of the developer audience, they just will turn around. They'll sniff that out immediately. <laughs> uh yes, totally. Uh all right, three apps you can't live without. Oh, golly. Okay. So, um, Slack, <laughs> Slack, I've got, I've got so many Slacks going on. It's like, it's the, it's the one place where you can always find me, whether it's the community Slack for Slack for app map, or it's like, you know, a, you know, a Boston startup Slack. I'm in all of these Slacks. Um, uh, let's see, what are the other, um, apps that I can't live without? Well, of course I can't live without my own app, app map. I, um, <laughs> I absolutely, I love playing with it. I was playing with it before I got on the, on the call today. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's so much fun to use and I, I, I absolutely adore it. And I think the other one is probably, I don't know, um, the last app that I absolutely can't live without. Um, I would probably say I can't live. I, so I listen to background music a lot while I'm working. I'm one of those people who has, who has to have like a little, another sensory thing going on. So I think mm -hmm. it's gotta be like Spotify. It, it's, we have different theme songs for different periods of time in the company. We have a playlist on Spotify oh, that's fun. <laughs> of songs that we've used throughout like different epochs of time, um, mm -hmm. for app map and, so I think that if, if somebody took away my Spotify, I would be, I would probably be less productive and I would probably be less, less, uh, less happy worker. Uh, I, I, I rave about Spotify all the time on this podcast too. People were like, we get it. You like Spotify. Uh, all right. Uh, no, it's how about so a good... fantastic. Oh, I mean, and they just keep adding value at like, literally, like I just had a recent episode that I just ranted about how they've now included 15 hours of audiobooks to my subscription. I didn't even know. And I discovered it. And I'm like, <gasps> now my audible has gone. <laughs> so like, yeah, it's really cut audible. And now I just, you know, have 15 hours, which is about the time that I used for Spotify. I mean, for audible audiobooks. So anyways. And if there's so much more discovery in Spotify than there is in other, in, in other platforms. Do you know what I mean? Like you find, mm -hmm new artists, you find new podcasts, you find new all sorts of, I just think that they're really crushing the algorithms, whatever they're doing. Which is mainly Boston based, right? The Echo Nest was driven that whole personalization and they did now, like for a while I struggled with the music discovery, but I think they finally figured that out where I am getting introduced a lot more stuff that isn't just exactly the lane that I listen to. It's like it broadening my horizons. And then all my podcasts used to be on Apple podcasts. Now they're all on Spotify. So it's all in one spot. So anyways, uh, yeah. how about a, a podcast or book recommendation? I guess kind of off that thread. Oh, okay. Yeah. Book recommendations. So right now I'm reading the creative act by Rick Rubin. Have, have you heard okay. of this book? 
Yeah, oh, it was so recently good. recommended. Yes. Okay. So we're going to have to so double good. down on that. So if you're not reading that or listening to that book, it sounds like it's a must. It's a must because, so I, I picked it up because I thought, well, you know, I work with all these creatives. I really want to understand creative process better. Developers are creatives. And, he, and, and in the beginning of the book, he democratizes creativity across what you do, what I do, what developers do, what artists do, what musicians do. And it, the structure of the book is really great because it's short, little, almost like little essays. Um, so you can kind of pick it up and put it down, but um, I'm loving it. I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with it right now. All right. Well, it's shortlisted for me now. Uh, what do you like to do for fun outside of work? Oh, um, so, uh, I, I've recently, um, taken up, um, cooking with my kids. Um, so I, so I, I do all kinds of things we do. Kevin and I are makers by like, you know, um, we like to make things. So if, whether it's baking or we're building an airplane in our garage, I've built what? a street legal, what? we're building what? A <laughs> what <laughs> oh baking building an airplane in your garage like what like what? Build a street legal rally car um you know so i like to do things with my hands like when i'm not because programming like you're you're working in your desktop you're working in your digital space so when i'm not when i'm not in digital space i need to be in like physical space right so we all need we all have this kind of like need to touch to do things like you know like i make i've learned to make croissants real great croissants um because it involves sort of like being in the physical space and like kneading the dough and stuff like that um so you know the other things we've done is we've got we bought during the pandemic we bought an airplane kit for a two-seater rv12 um real airplane really cool. an airplane <laughs> kit <laughs> that reminds and me of like the like is it a pro the progressive commercial where it's like I don't know which one it was, but to like build a lake kit is like one of the things that they're just making fun of. But anyway, so you have a, yeah. uh, wow. We have an airplane kit and we rivet in the garage. Um, we're riveting it together um, and mm. we'll eventually hopefully fly this plane. And before that, I worked with my kids. So, I, you know, the thing is, is like when I grew up in Virginia, you had to take shop like to graduate from high school. I don't mm -hmm. know if that was true. And you were in New Hampshire, right? Did you have to take shop? Yeah, like at my junior high, like that was part of what I did. Uh, you know, woodworking, shop, like it was all, you know, home ec, but not high school, but. Yeah, yeah, we had to take shop. And so they don't teach shop anymore. And so um, my, when I was 16, I rebuilt a Datsun 280Z with my dad. Like we disassembled everything on the kitchen table. We, you know, put the engine back together. We the, we had like one 280Z where we were like taking parts off of it and putting it onto the other 280Z. So, you know, I knew a lot about cars and how cars work and mechanical, you know, aspects of cars. And no, people don't know that anymore. Like nope. they don't know how their cars work. They can't change their tire. And so right. we got a kit to build a car with, and we put it together with our kids when they were like six and eight, maybe. And I've got a picture of my six, my eight year old at the time sitting on the transmission with a blammer, like putting the, <laughs> putting the bolts in. And, and now That's I can so be awesome. like, Owen, go repair the vacuum cleaner. And he'll just like go and do it if he's 16. <laughs> and so, and so we have to keep these like things going, but the problem is, is we've already built a car. So like, what are you going to build next? Well, I guess it's a plane. So we're going to build a plane. And then we'll see if we have to build like a locomotive or a boat or something. <laughs> <laughs> that is fascinating. I love, love, love that. That is so cool. That's but that's the best answer I've ever had to that question. <laughs> like, that's, like, wow. Very cool. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. We're going to run out of things. Eventually it's going to be like, we're going to be competing with like, <laughs> Right. We're going to be competing with like SpaceX in my garage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, oh, we got to go to Mars. <laughs> I know, I'm running out of things. I need something interstellar. <laughs> well, Elizabeth, thanks so much for taking the time to walk us through your background story. Obviously, the journey Thank you've you. been on building companies and obviously all the great advice. Thank you so much for having me, Keith. I really appreciate being on the show. Mm -hmm.